All right, well, I think uh, this is what we got, and so I'm going to get started. Any of the stragglers, they can come in and just have a seat and kind of join in and stuff like that. So, again, welcome to in-flight pilot training. It's our Saturday morning seminars and stuff, so glad you're here. It's, uh, it's always good to see people. Uh, my name's Rob. I'm one of the CFIs. Uh, just a real quick blurbage about me. I got 1,500 hours, 1,000 hours of training or in dual instruction given and stuff. So I'm just your basic CFI right now, working on my double I. Uh, I came from the Navy background, eight years in the, working on P3 Orions. So that's always been a passion of mine, working on aircraft. Got out of there and got into the corporate world for quality engineering. So I kind of, my mindset's always on little details and how to keep things from breaking. Um, survived that for about 16 years and Got let go, you know, I was the last person to get laid off out of our department and wife asked me, what are you going to do now? So, but during that time frame, I had a little aerobat, a little Cessna 150 aerobat and got my private license and uh, decided to take a little vacation that I hadn't had for 10 years. So took my little airplane and flew it out to Bozeman, Montana and picked up a friend of mine who was out there and gave him a lift home to Florida. So dropped him off and grabbed his neighbor and took him up to Oshkosh for the air show for the week <laughs> and then uh, came back home so a week and a half later 52 hours in the cockpit and you know when I started the flight I could actually see the cowling by the time I got back my seat had compressed so much I was like flying IFR <laughs> and uh, wife's like so <laughs> what are you gonna do I said I want to be a professional pilot she's like you have really lost your mind haven't you you're you know you're 48 years old and this and that and I'm like well I'm going to do what I love doing. So, but she supported me in it. She uh, said, "All right, go do it. You know, make it happen." So, finished up the rest of my ratings and just flew the living daylights out of that little 150 and got my hours up to where they needed to be. And now I'm a CFI, so here I am enjoying life and I love taking people up and showing them what it's all about. And so it works pretty well. It works pretty well. I, I'm happy coming to work. So. Wish I could say the same for my wife. She's looks at me like, yeah, get out of here. <laughs> so, but uh, so that's kind of my story here. So I love doing presentations and stuff like that. We kind of pull these together for everybody. Um, and here we've got some pilots and some non-pilots. I'm kind of getting a feel that most of the ladies are the non-pilots. That's is that correct? That's and that seems pretty typical. Pretty typical. Now, what this course is designed for? What I brought this. PowerPoint together is a few years ago I was starting to read through you know some of these FAA websites and some of the accident reports where pilots were, were becoming incapacitated okay and then a passenger of some sort had to take over and they've actually landed the airplane successfully and that was with help through air traffic control you know talking to center and stuff like that and you know talking to another airplane just helping them to talk their way down and even my own my own bride, uh, we were flying one day and I had radio problems. I said, honey, just take the yoke and fly straight. She's like, I'm not touching a thing. And I'm like, okay, I'm flying into a little bee's nest of a, a fly-in, no radio. And I'm going, okay, this isn't good. So I'm trying to troubleshoot and finally I just took her headset. She's like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, I got to talk. So having that in mind, kind of said, okay, let's pull something like this together and it's really it's specifically designed um, just to get you on the ground safely and walk away from that airplane okay um, I don't care if you bend that airplane I don't care if you break the gear that's what insurance is for the whole goal is to get you on the ground safely so you can walk away all right and that is what is the premises of this it's really a bare bones how can I get this plane on the ground all right so with that said any more training that you want to do, we highly encourage it. Okay, after the end of this presentation, there's usually two or three flights. If you wanted to join us, we can kind of get you into that environment and let you see what it's like to fly the plane. Obviously, your spouses or significant others, whoever, you're flying with them, so you have some familiarity of what's going on in the cockpit. Some things might be a total mystery to you, but some of it's going to be like, okay, I see what he's doing. You know, it can't be that difficult. And it's not really. The only difference between an aircraft and a car is we get to go up and down also, besides left and right. So, and we'll try to take some of the mystery out of some of the things here. Okay, so if you have questions, 
feel free to chime in and let me know right away as we work through the slides. There's like 34 of them, so the presentation will be probably about an hour, maybe a little less, depending on if you have questions or not. And if you have other people that might be interested in this course, send them out to us, let them know. Hey, and we'll redo the seminar. We'll kind of have them feed through throughout the year stuff. So if somebody missed something, we can always come back. Trevor is recording them, so you can go to the website if you want to review it. If you have friends over at the house and say, here, just check this out, go to this website. They should be able to review it there also, okay? So most of the pilots here, they're gonna, they grew up here in this, aviate, navigate, communicate. I like to add to it, aviate, aviate, mm -hmm. aviate. Rule number one, fly the plane. I don't care what's going on, what else is going on, always keep that primary. Fly that airplane. That's the whole goal here, okay? Then the second part of it is, is navigate. Where are we, where are we gonna be going, okay? How can I get this plane onto the ground into a safe area, all right? Then we have communicate. So aviate, navigate, communicate. Think of it in that order, okay? Someone might be talking to you in your headset, if you're having problems flying that airplane, just ignore it, you know. Well, I've had situations where ATC's talking to me and I'm trying to get something straightened out and it's, I just go, hold, you know. Just wait, I'll be with you in a minute, that sort of thing, okay. So those are the three rules of flying here. Again, this is going to be very basic, okay. So I want you to kind of learn what are some of the parts of the aircraft and what they're for. Obviously you've been around some of these airplanes, so you might already know what they are, okay? We'll just go into them a little bit more detail as we go through these. Your basic aircraft, okay? Well, you've got your little Piper up there, a little 140, okay? This is a low wing airplane. Those of you that are flying the Cessnas are flying a high wing airplane. The only difference is where's the wing positioned on the fuselage, okay? So we've got our power plant with the prop. Obviously that's our engine, just like in your car. So the prop's attached to it directly to the cam or the crankshaft of it. It's gonna provide the thrust to pull that airplane forward, get you through the air, okay? We've got our wings. That's gonna provide lift. It's an essential piece of the airplane. If for some reason you don't have your wing, well, you're beyond this class. <laughs> so you got other issues to worry about, okay? The landing gear, you see in this aircraft, this is a fixed landing gear airplane. Most of you right now are flying fixed gear, okay? The Cessna 172s are all fixed gear. All the little, little Piper 161s are all fixed gear. You might have the opportunity to get in an aircraft that has retractable gear. Those are the ones that just fold up and nice and neat and, you know, give you a nice streamlined airplane, okay? The fuselage is gonna give us where we put all of our cargo put our passengers, everything's gonna fit in there, all right? And then we got the empennage back in this area, which is just like the tail feathers on either a dart or an arrow, it's just gonna stabilize that aircraft as it's going through the air, okay? Any questions on just your basics of just what that aircraft has, okay? No? All righty. So let's look at the surfaces that we have for you, right? your basic wing, all right? It's gonna generate the lift for this airplane, okay? We can go into the details of how, but it's basically just the shape of it. It's got a higher curve to the top than it does on the bottom, so we're generating a high lift, high pressure area on the bottom, a low pressure area on the top. Low, high seeks low, okay? So things are gonna to wanna to go up for us, all right? Flaps. We have a couple of things attached to that wing, okay? Flaps, they're very essential. Not every plane has them though. What they're gonna do for us is basically for you guys is when we deploy the flaps, it's gonna help that airplane produce a little bit of drag. It's also gonna produce a little bit of extra lift as we get slower and slower. The main thing us pilots use them for is when we start to descend, we're gonna put a little bit of flap out there so that we can get that descent rate going without increasing our airspeed. So I kind of like to use the flaps. <coughs> they kind of come, they come out in degrees, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, and 30 degrees. Some of you might have aircraft that actually go out to 40. That's like putting parachutes out there when you get out to 40. So I have an analogy that I use for flaps that I teach my students. 
when you're at 10% yeah. or 10 degrees of flaps, I kind of think of it, it's providing you 90% lift and 10% drag because there's just barely getting into the slipstream. As we get into 20 degrees of flaps, which is about halfway, now you're kind of splitting the drag versus the lift at about a 50-50. Okay. Now when you get to full flaps, which is 30 degrees or 40, depending on the aircraft you have, well then it's just the other way around. It's like 90% drag and about 10% lift. You can literally take that airplane and just put that nose way down full flaps, your airspeed's not going to increase yet. So it's, it's literally like putting parachutes out there. So, okay. Ailerons, those are on the outboard side of the wing. This is what's gonna make that aircraft bank left or right. When we're in the cockpit and we're using the controls, those are gonna be fluctuating up and down. The flaps just go in a down position. They don't go up at all. Well, they go up into the wing, but they don't deflect upward into the slipstream, okay? Here we got an idea of how all that's gonna work. How does that airplane bank to the left? How does that airplane bank to the right? Here we have a typical yoke in our aircraft. Those of you in the 172s, th that's pretty common. Even in the Pipers, you probably see this, but you might see a bar over the top of it sometimes. When you get into some of the other aircraft, the other one, it might be hard to see here. Can I turn this off for a second? There we go. Here you can just see a joystick, okay? And it's the same thing. You just, to the left, to the right, front, and back. And it's gonna be the same function as what we have here on the yoke, okay? It's called a yoke, all right? And when we wanna go to the left, it's just like your steering wheel in the car. We're gonna turn it to the left, and it's gonna cause these ailerons to go in the opposite direction. This one's in the down position, so it's gonna wanna force that air, that slipstream, it's gonna wanna force that air or the wing in the up position. On the other side, we have the aileron up into the slipstream, it's gonna force that wing to go down. In this condition, the airplane's gonna bank off to the right, okay? If you want to go to the left, you just turn it to the left, and the opposite will happen. So they're gonna be opposite of each other. All righty. You want the lights on? Um, you okay with the lights off? Good. It's actually probably a little easier to see the slides. Yeah. Okay, good. Any questions on how ailerons are, how work for the airplane? So if we want to go to the left, just turn to the left. Want to go to the right, just turn to the right. Use a little bit of caution, because you can keep turning and keep turning. Next thing you know, you're going to be at 90 degrees of a bank, you know. For those of you that are just literally in that situation where you need to get the airplane, you know, there's an indicator in here that we'll get to a little bit later, and it's marked off in degrees. You know, you got a 10, 20, 30, 45, and 90, you know, and I'll show you, when you go into your banks, don't get too carried away. It's just uh, one of those things, okay? Our flaps, you can kind of see in here how the flaps work. They just come down. Um, there's two different types that you might come across in your flying career. This one here is an electric flap. It's run by electric motors. And you can see it's, it's marked from here, zero to 10 degrees, 10 to 20, and then full flap 20 to 30. All right, that, they're electric. The other version that you might find, such as in your pipers, are mechanical. And it's just a big lever right here. So as you pull it up, and it's gonna be notched, so there's gonna be a little button that sits right here. You're gonna push that button in and you can pull that lever up. And it'll take a little bit of arm strength, you know, because they're not electric, so it's actually, it's a mechanical pull. So you push the button in, pull it up until it clicks. That's gonna be your first 10 degrees of flaps. If you want more flaps, pull the button, pull it up to the next notch, and that's gonna be 20 degrees. And then the last one, push the button, give it a good pull all the way to the top, and that's gonna be 30 degrees of flaps. If you wanted to get rid of your flaps and bring them back up into the wing, you just pull the button and nice and easy, let that thing go back down to the ground, okay? I would not recommend just letting it drop, but definitely hold on to it. There's gonna be some, some force there, so when you do grab it, make sure you have a good hand hold on it, okay? You'll notice on here, it's nice and sideways. It looks like a flap, okay? Those of you that have the opportunity to get in a retractable airplane with retractable gear, 
you're going to see a little round knob that looks like a tire. That's the gear. Okay. So when you go to grab either one, know which one you're grabbing. Because you might think you're putting the flaps down, but you might be actually putting the gear down. So the gear is going to look like a tire. The flap's just going to have a, a lever, so it looks more like a flap. And you'll see it. They're, they're pretty darn close. They're sitting right up into the cockpit. Okay. Something about the flaps. In an emergency situation, again, the whole goal is just to get the aircraft on the ground. So, but on the airspeed indicator, there's going to be some different lines on there, different colored lines, and we'll cover that in a couple of slides here. Um, ideally, we want to be in what we call that white arc before we start to deploy the flaps. Okay, in an emergency situation, almost always you can at least go 10 degrees without hurting the aircraft or without damaging the flaps. But in this situation, again, Try to remain calm, be cool about it. If you see the airspeed and you got that little needle up there and it's showing 130, 140 and your flaps are at 80, okay, we gotta figure out how to slow the airplane down a little bit in order to put flaps out there, but in a dire emergency, who cares? Go 10 degrees, all right? The whole condition here is just to get you on the ground, all right? The back part of the aircraft, it's called the epinage. This is where we're going to get all of our stabilization out of the plane. Okay, it's, again, it's like the feathers on a dart or an arrow. Okay, we've got different parts: vertical, horizontal. Okay. Let's back up a little bit there. There we go. Uh, all right, come on. Ah. There, there, <laughs> there, all right. The vertical stabilizer is going to keep the aircraft, the nose, pretty well straight forward. It's not going to let yaw to the left or right. We call that a yaw condition, okay? It's kind of like, think of your axes, your X, Y, and Z axes. You know, if you go back to chemistry, or not chemistry, but calculus type of class, okay? To the vertical, we've got our rudder attached, okay? So when we have our rudder pedals, which are we use for, with our feet, you know that's going to make the nose go left or right on it. Okay. On our horizontal stabilizer, which is really nothing more than a, it's another wing. This wing is designed in order to push down force in order to keep the nose up. But we have an elevator that's attached to it. That's another movable surface. That's going to be with the yoke, you know, pulling back and forth, and it's going to create pitch on the airplane. It's going to bring the either the nose is going to come up or the nose is going to go down. Okay, and all of that's attached to the epinage of the aircraft. You can kind of see in here again. We have our yoke. Here's our elevator back here, the horizontal stabilizer, and our vertical stabilizer with the rudder there. If we pull that yoke back and forth. We're going to be changing the pitch on the airplane. So. Most of us, when we get up there flying, for the non-pilots, you're gonna be flying visually most of the time. I hope you're flying visually, you're not IFR, okay? If it's IFR, when we got some other things we gotta think about. But you're gonna be looking out that window 90% of the time, okay? Almost 100% of the time. Use the horizon of the Earth as your reference point. And either the cowling on the airplane, which covers the engine, or the dash. Use those two, that is your reference. If you're flying along and all of a sudden you're pulling back and you don't even know it, and you see the nose out of the airplane coming higher and higher above the earth, the horizon of the earth, you know something's changing in your pitch. Or if you notice the earth and the nose is dropping more and more and more, you know the nose of the airplane is dropping. You're going to start descending. So that is your big key reference, and that is what we teach all of our students initially, right up front on the first couple of flights, is to be able to look at that horizon, look at the dash, or look at the nose of the airplane, and that is your big key. That's your reference point for what, what's happening outside that airplane. Okay. So when you notice a change, you can correct for it. Okay. In the stick. Same thing, you just pull straight forward or straight back, and you're just adjusting the pitch of the airplane, whether the nose is going to go up or down. Okay. 
we have a trim wheel, okay? Those of us that fly love the trim wheel, especially for pilots and everything else. This trim wheel, when, when you've got that yoke in your hand and you're pulling back on it, trying to hold level flight, whatever that force is, and you're sitting there just holding it, holding it. Think of like holding a big watermelon. After about a minute or two, it just starts getting heavier and heavier and heavier, and you're just, it's gonna get harder to hold that. The same thing's gonna happen in the aircraft. If you're constantly holding back to hold that nose up at a certain attitude, we have what we call a trim wheel, okay? That we can trim it and take that pressure off of our fingers until the airplane is what we kind of call hands-free, stable flight, okay? It's in a couple of different locations. It's typically a big wheel like this. You know, you'll see it there and there. Um, some of them, it's right in the dead center. Depending on which aircraft, they might move it just a little bit. Some of you, if you're ever in a twin airplane, it's usually off to the pilot's side, right by his right knee, okay? It's gonna be marked on the top and on the bottom, nose down, nose up. It seems a little bit counterintuitive, but what you're doing is when you wheel that wheel to the down position or you're rolling it downward like this, you're actually bringing that nose up. And what's happening is you're just relieving some of that pressure off of your fingers. So what I would recommend if you're in this situation and you're holding the yoke and you find yourself either pushing or pulling the yoke continuously, okay? If you're pulling, obviously you want that nose to come up. You're holding it back. The nose wants to drop on you, so you're holding the nose up. Start wheeling it for nose up trim until all of a sudden you can kind of let go of it and the plane just stays right where it's at, okay? Then the plane's trimmed out. Now you can basically fly with just your thumb and a couple of fingers. You're not fighting the airplane. The airplane's doing all the work for you, okay? And it's kind of like power steering in your car. Helps a lot. Or vice versa, if you find the nose wants to come up all the time and you're constantly pushing on that yoke to keep the nose down, same thing. Take this wheel and wheel it in the direction that it says. It'll say nose down. Go that direction until you, you can stop pushing on that yoke. You might not get it absolutely perfect. You might still have a little bit of pressure there, but it's not in a situation where your arms are gonna get tired holding it. Okay. Do you have to lock it in place or anything? No, it just stays. That's a, there's a little tab on the very end of that elevator, you know, on the epinage. There's a little tab out there, and all you're doing is changing that little tab, and it helps relieve the pressures off of that whole yoke. Because as the elevator comes up, it's into the slipstream of the air, so the air itself is trying to push it back down. You, you're trying to hold it up into that slipstream. It's like taking your arm out that window while you're driving along, and then you go like this. Your arm wants to go up right? Mm -hmm. And you're forcing your arm to stay down. You can adjust that little trim tab in the back to where it equalizes the pressure. Some aircraft have an autopilot and that might be engaged, okay? And there's a little trim button that says trim. And sometimes you can trim up, you can trim down electronically just with a little button on the yoke, okay? Autopilots are great. If it's engaged, I would keep it that way until we can talk to somebody and let them start walking you through how to disengage the autopilot and how to start getting the airplane down. But the autopilot's gonna fly the plane for you, okay? We're not gonna cover that part of it during this seminar, okay? Because that kind of gets a little bit more in depth than what we want, all right? But again, the big key here is we kind of tell our students there's two, two of your best friends in the airplane is your CFI and your trim wheel. So kind of keeps everything nice and easy, okay? So it stays in place. Don't have to move it. Just for your first ours in the ceiling. So. Is it? Oh. It's a crank in the ceiling. There you go. Yep, you're, you're absolutely right. It's been a while since I've seen one of those. So yeah, if it's not here, look up here. But they're usually labeled trim, and it'll give you an arrow, left or right, which way. Okay, nose up or nose down. So, And it's usually not much of a, a turn, maybe a, a one turn, maybe a half a turn, just to get the trim to settle in. So. Yeah, I, yeah, my friend's Apache's got one of those. Thanks for the reminder. I keep, you know, we get so accustomed to where they are in the airplanes that you fly, and they are in different places. They are in different places. Good, thank you. 
and there's the little trim tab. So here's your elevator sitting right there, your stabilizer, and here's your elevator. So if this is constantly down into that slipstream, obviously the wind wants to pull that back up and make it easy. And this little tab is actually just going to go in the opposite direction of wherever you have the elevator. And that's where you're going to get that little opposite flow of air, kind of neutralizing that pressure on the yoke. Okay. The rudder, so it's attached to our vertical stabilizer, and you'll see it's got a little trim tab on this one also. Not every airplane has a trim tab. A lot of like our 172s that you guys are seeing, or the little Pipers, most of those have a little metal tab that's it's adjusted on the ground by the pilot. You know, when he goes and flies, if he finds he's always flying a little sideways, okay, he'll go out there and he'll bend this little metal tab, or if he's always using a little rudder one direction or the other, they can bend it into the slipstream just to help neutralize some of that pressure. If you do have a rudder trim, then you can mechanically change it within the aircraft, just like the elevator trim, okay? So the rudder's gonna give us our left-right yaw. There's our rudder, okay, same little airplane. This one, uh, doesn't show it. Usually there's gonna be a little tiny metal tab that sits right down here, just enough to help relieve some of that pressure with the slipstream of the air, okay? There's our rudder pedals. They help us keep the airplane coordinated, all right? So what do I mean by coordinated, okay? Think of your car driving around and all of a sudden you go around the corner and it's slippery. And all of a sudden the back end of the car kind of comes out from you. You feel like your body, or you take a turn too quick, you feel like your body's getting pushed up against the door, right? Or it's getting pushed up next to, you know, whoever's sitting next to you. You know, I call it the SOB, slide over, you know. And uh, the rudder basically just gives us that stay in your seat feeling, okay? So when we go through the turns, go into a bank, all right? You can apply a little bit of rudder in that direction. For us, for you, just trying to get this airplane on the ground, almost all of these airplanes are stable enough to where you're gonna need very minimal input on the rudder just use bank the plane. It, it'll go where it wants you to go. You're not gonna have the most coordinated, most beautiful turn there is, but it's gonna get you where you wanna go. So this is kinda like of what I would consider minimal use for you. Now, those of you that have flown a little bit and you kinda have an idea for that, go ahead. There's a piece of equipment in there, a turn coordinator, and we'll cover that in a few moments. And that'll kinda tell you what we call the quality of your turn, you know. If you're banking that airplane and you're turning and you feel like your whole body and you use your kinetic senses on your body, if you feel like you're actually still sitting versus being slid left or right, your turn's coordinated. You're not flying the airplane sideways, that sort of deal, okay? There's two positions that I want you to keep in mind where your feet are on the rudder pedals. When they're down here at the bottom, okay, and you're pushing left or right, you're pushing that rudder on the airplane. All right, now once you get that airplane on the ground, where's the brakes? The brakes are on the top part of this pedal, okay? So when you wanna stop, you slide your toes from down here, up here, and you start pushing forward because the pedals are gonna rotate forward also, okay? Those are your brakes, they're differential braking. Differential braking meaning this is for the left tire, this is for the right tire. So if you push just the left one, the airplane's gonna wanna spin to the left. If you push just the right one, it's gonna wanna spin to the right. So, and it takes a little bit, and we teach you this on the first one, when you go to taxi the airplane, you're not taxiing with the, the yoke. You're steering with your feet. So most people kinda go, okay, what am I doing here? You gotta get, mentally I go, okay, I gotta use my feet to drive this. And you're using your feet left and right to steer left and right. And then as you go to stop, you slide your toes up and you start applying some brakes. And you push the pedals forward. Okay? That's usually the, the, the biggest thing right there with the first student on the first flight. They're just kind of trying to get that concept going. And you can tell because they're taxiing all over the road. You know, they're, they can never hold it straight, which is the tower. They sit up there and they giggle. Yep, we got a new one. So, but you get used to it pretty quick. 
But then you get in your car and go drive home. Then you're, you're back to, all right, it wasn't my feet or my hands. You know, uh, what am I doing here? Okay. So again, you push the left one, it's going to pull that nose to the left while you're flying. You push the right pedal, it's going to push the nose to the right while you're flying. Okay. In this situation where you just want to get the airplane on the ground, very minimal input you're going to need for the rudder pedals. The biggest key is just what do you do when you get on the ground? Where's the brakes? So now you know where the brakes are. Okay. Any questions on that so far? All right. Not, not all planes have brakes on the passenger side. Either. No, not all of them do, and that's unfortunate. So it, uh, I would. There's dozens. No, well, at that point, you're just basically going to run it <laughs> off the end of the runway, <laughs> and uh, hopefully, you got full power. You're able to turn the airplane off. I'll show you where the mixture control is, to where you can just chop the power and you can just coast to a stop, um, and that's the main thing. So th that is correct. Not all airplanes have them on the right side. Bonanzas are very notorious for that just the pilot gets the brakes so so if something happens there either you got to get them out of the seat if you really That's want right. the brakes yeah, yeah. The just unbuckle them open the door yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll pick you up later no so um that's just kidding there but uh yeah <laughs> yeah and there are some aircraft out there um that actually have a handbrake some of them are handbrakes. It's kind of like what you would use for your flaps. There's a, a lever there. And some of them do have a handbrake. So the first thing you want to check while you're flying on your side, okay, is it if it's just a flat bar and you look over, you know, at the pilot side and, and it's a full pedal, he's got brakes. If you're just a little flat bar, you don't have brakes. You already know that right there. Okay. If you've got the full pedal like this, that usually goes up, you know. You can, you can slide your feet up. If you're flying along and, and it's your airplane now, you know, you can, you can push them. Yep, yep, okay, I got that, you know, if everything's going okay for you, all right? Um, now we're going to get into some power for the airplane, and you'll kind of get used to, okay, where do we get our throttles, and what are these knobs and buttons for, okay? So most of our aircraft, your smaller ones, your 152s, your 172s, your Pipers and stuff like that, this is a very common setup right here. You're going to have two levers. One is your throttle, one is your mixture. Okay. We'll start with the throttle. This is the exact same thing as the foot pedal in your car. You push your foot down on it, you're going to give more gas to the engine, you're going to get more power. Okay. You slide it forward, more power, you slide it back, you're going to go towards idle. It's as simple as that. And it's usually a big black lever, you know, very pronounced. You can't miss it, okay? This one over here is your mixture, okay? How much gas are we going to give the carburetor? As we go up in altitude, there's less air. So if we do this, if this is pushed all the way forward, okay, you're giving it a lot of gas but very little air. The engine is running really, really rich. More, it's getting more fuel than the cylinders can actually burn, basically. Okay. This one here, we've got one extra. It's the prop lever. Some of you that get into a little bit more higher performance aircraft, you might have a prop lever. Okay. What that's doing when you have it all the way forward or all the way back, all you're doing is changing the pitch of that propeller blade. So it either takes a bigger bite of air or a less bite of air. You can kind of think of it as riding a 10-speed bike. Do you want it in first gear where it's real easy for the engine to, to spin over? Or do you want it in 10th gear where it's really kind of lugging and using a lot of work? Okay. For us, as the pinch hitter pilot, I'm just going to have you take the mixture control and that prop lever if you have one, just push them forward and just leave them there. Don't worry about it. The airplane's going to fly just fine. Okay? What's going to happen right here and right here? The airplane's going to use a little bit more fuel. You're giving the engine all the fuel it needs. Okay? But if you're at altitude and now you're starting to come down, you're descending towards the ground, you're getting more and more air, more and more air, more and more air, because air is denser down here than it is up at 8,000 feet. The engine's basically just going to run better and better and better. Okay. 
if you left this prop lever, or not the prop lever, but the mixture control where it was at altitude, the pilot, he leaned the engine out. We like to have what we call a 15 to 1 ratio. 15 parts of air, one part fuel. That is the optimum burn inside that cylinder when that spark goes off, okay? That's at altitude. Now if you leave that there, because he's already pulled some gas away from that engine, now you start descending and you start coming closer and closer to the ground, the air gets denser and denser, you're causing that engine to run really lean, meaning you're getting more air than you are fuel. At some point, you might not be getting enough fuel to that cylinder to actually make it work. The engine could stall. Okay, so in this situation for us, just take that red lever, just push it all the way forward. Just leave it there. It's one less thing you have to worry about on your plate. You've got enough to handle right now just getting this airplane on the ground. Okay, the prop lever, typically at cruise, the pilot's going to have that prop lever pulled about halfway back. He's adjusting what we call the RPM. He's adjusting the pitch on that blade to get a certain RPM on the engine. Okay, so what he's essentially done when he takes off, he's got a very low pitch. He's making that engine run really easy in order to climb out. He's giving the engine a lot of power. Okay, once you get into cruise, he's going to open up that pitch, take a bigger bite of air. It's like taking your 10 speed bike and putting it into fourth gear, fifth gear, sixth gear, so it's easier to go. It's easier for you to pedal. Same thing for the plane, right? So now, when we're coming back down and you need to get on the ground, take that blue lever nice and easy and just push it all the way forward. You're going to be changing the pitch of that blade to a very slight pitch, so it's taking a very little bite of air. And you're actually, what you're going to feel in that airplane is like you're going to feel like somebody hit the brakes. Okay? That propeller acts like a brake. Because now, instead of taking such a big bite of air, pulling you forward, now it's like, whoa, it's taking a little bite of air, and it's going to slow you down. But the engine's going to work much easier. It's one less thing you have to worry about, okay? So again, take your mixture and your prop and just move them forward, okay? Don't have to worry about it. The only thing left is just your throttle, and that's the same thing as your foot pedal in your car, okay? Go forward, you got more power for the engine, you pull it back, you got less power, okay? Any questions on this right here? Will the throttle stall the plane or just the mixture? Um, will the throttle stall the plane? Like if you put it down too fast? Or? No, because even if you pull it all the way back, the engine's still going to run it like idle. Just like in your car when you start it up and it's in park, it's just idling. A lot of our cars have an RPM gauge in them. You ever notice that? Anybody not have one in your car? You'll see it's, it's idling at about 600 RPM. That's exactly what this is going to do. Now what stalls the airplane is a lack of air speed over the wing. Lack of air flow over the wing. That's what stalls the plane. Okay. And we can correct that with our pitch. So in the aviation world, you're going to hear really quick, especially if I go fly with you, we pitch for airspeed and we use power for altitude. Okay, so if I want you to fly at 100 miles an hour, we're going to control the pitch of the airplane until that airspeed reads 100. And we're going to just control it right there. We'll set our trim to take the pressures off the yoke. And then now, are we climbing or descending, holding that attitude of the airplane? <coughs> and if we're climbing, we can pull just a little bit of power back until we stop climbing. Now we're holding the altitude that we want, plus we're holding the airspeed that we want. See how that works? Mm -hmm. So we pitch for airspeed, use power for altitude. If we reduce power enough, and we're still, we're, every time we change the power setting, we're going to have to change the pitch just a little bit in order to hold that airspeed. And that's what's going to give us either a climb or a slight descent. So if someone says to you, okay, I want you to control that airplane at 100 miles an hour, and I want you to start to descend, okay, you're going to pull a little bit of power back, adjust your pitch to hold 100 miles an hour, and then you're going to go, oh, okay, I am starting to descend. And like, good, just leave it right there until you get down to the altitude that they want you to be at. All right. Any other questions on this right here? Okay. 
here we have a few things where we kind of like what you're going to see in the airplane. Okay, you've got the, the throttle quadrants, you know, your throttle, your prop, and your mixture maybe. Okay, where do I find that information on the, on the dash of the airplane? Okay, you'll see quite often there's going to be two of these sitting right over here. One's going to be an RPM, just like in your car, and if you have a prop lever, okay, many times you're going to have what we call a manifold pressure gauge. These are basically interchangeable for you, okay. Again, you're going to take that mixture, go full rich, you're going to take the prop, go full forward, all right, now you're just left with that throttle lever, and you're either going to use the RPM or this, whichever one you have in your aircraft. And this is kind of an indicator of how much power do I have going to that airplane, okay. And they're usually sitting just off to the left a little bit. And you can see here, here's your throttle, here's your prop lever, here's your mixture control, <coughs> there's your flap switch, nice and flat, okay. You'll kind of see up here, they give us some indicators. Green is your typical type of cruise flight if you're just cruising along. You know, and they say, hey, we want you to set your RPM for 2200. You're going to take your throttle right here. You just pull it back a little bit until your RPM reaches 2200. And you'll just leave it there. Or they might give you some other instructions when you're talking to somebody. Okay, And this would be the same thing. It's just a different version of giving you the RPM. It's manifold pressure. You had something? It looked like you wanted to say something. Well, yeah, because in a complex air, I mean, you still have an RPM. Mm -hmm. But if you have your... But that's a, adjusted with your prop. Uh, right, so, so. should you just look at the manifold pressure, not, not the RPM. Yeah. Okay. Yep, so... Is anybody flying? You're, it's kind of confusing. I wouldn't go over it if, we're not, you know, if you don't have it. We do, though. Oh, we you do? Have mm -hmm. it. Okay. Sorry. So I need to know yep. about the manifold. Okay, so you got a, a pitch control in your prop? Mm -hmm. Norman, mm -hmm. let's know if you have a pitch control in your prop. Yes. Yes, I do, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So again, if you're in that situation, just take that blue lever, push it all the way forward. Mm -hmm. It's going to adjust your RPM, because that's what that blue lever is for, is to give you a specific RPM. That's right. Yep. And, and just ignore the RPM. And go ignore the RPM, use your throttle, your, you know, your, thr your thrust lever, and just watch the manifold pressure, because that's this. I think I got that. Yep. Now as you pull that throttle back and you're adjusting your manifold pressure, your RPM will drop with it. But don't give that a lot of authority. Give this your primary attention. Okay. That's what he was trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. He wanted you to tell me that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's how that works. So um, any other questions on this piece? Okay. Again, just a real quick how to cover those up, push that full forward, push full forward, and we'll use the black lever, okay? And that's just your main thing. So you're back down to just one, one thing you gotta think about, okay? Eliminating the stuff off the checklist. <coughs> instruments, some of the other instruments that we have here, okay? What are all they for? Um, you'll kind of see what we call in Many of the aviation world, a standard, what we call standard six pack. Analog gauges, steam gauges, you're going to hear them referred to a lot. Steam gauges, analog gauges, six pack type gauges. Some of you that might have uh, the more fancier of airplanes might have a glass cockpit. It's, it looks like a little TV screen there, okay? Um, those are set up a little bit different. Okay, it still gives you the same information, but you gotta know where to look to find those. The majority of this presentation is set up for just your standard aircraft. Um, a lot of you, a lot of the airplanes still have this. We're just now starting to get into that world of glass cockpits and people are upgrading their aircraft, but it's a spendy thing to do, so a lot of people still have this piece of it. So we'll cover this, your standard six pack, and your engine gauge is there, okay? Aviate. This is how we're going to fly the plane. Rule number one, aviate. Aviate, aviate, aviate. Fly the plane. Okay, everything else is second or third. Secondary or third. Okay. And what we're going to have here is our airspeed indicator, our attitude indicator, and our altitude. Okay. So those are the three main things that you're going to be kind of glancing at. You're looking outside 99% of the time. I want you to fly visually. 
Okay, stay away from the clouds, stay away from towers, stay away from buildings, maneuver yourself, whatever you need to do. Okay, but look out that window. You can look in here to kind of give you an idea of what's going on with this airplane. Am I getting the performance out of it that I think I should need or what somebody's telling me I should get? And where, to, where do I look to find that information? Okay, so your airspeed's always gonna be sitting right here. I can't say always. Depending on what airplane you're in, some of these older airplanes from the 50s and 60s, they'll put gauges wherever. <laughs> they, they'll stuff them in wherever they can get them to fit. Okay, but it'll still give you the same information, all right? Airspeed indicator, okay? It's got some colored rings. Remember earlier I was talking about the flaps, okay? So in this situation, anything in this white arc, if your airspeed indicator is anywhere in there, you're safe to put full flaps if you wanted to, okay? If you're above the white arc on most of these airplanes, you can go at least 10 degrees of flaps you're not gonna hurt anything, okay? Anything more than that, you might get some, some buffeting, you might have something going on in the aircraft. We need to slow the airplane down, okay? The green arc, this is what we consider normal operating speeds for the airplane. Without flaps, if the flaps are in the up position, so basically that wing is what we call clean, right? We can fly anywhere from here up to here safely, okay? <coughs> in calm wind conditions, it's not bumpy, there's no turbulence while you're flying along. I'm sure all of you have experienced some turbulence. All of a sudden, eh, bonk, okay, road bump, eh, bonk, road bump, you know, that sort of thing. Um, there's a yellow line here. It's the caution line. Smooth air only, okay? Basically what this is telling you, you take your car and you're driving nice and slow, five miles an hour over that speed bump. It's nice and easy for the shocks. It's easy for all the suspension to take it. Now, you come flying over that thing at 60 miles an hour. You hit the same speed bump. What have you just done? You've, you probably blew your shock out. You might have blown your tire out. That's exactly what's gonna happen up here. So if it's turbulent, it's bumpy, all you're doing is adding excessive load to that airplane in order for it to handle those bumps. So we need to slow that airplane down into this green arc. Okay, so for you in this pinch hitter course, I would like to see you try to keep this airplane about mid-level. Excessive speeds, you really won't need that. Okay, and just kind of know where the white arc is and the green arc. The red arc, you've got some problems. That airplane's probably in a a pretty good nose down attitude. You're gonna have to kind of correct for that and get the plane to level off again. Pull some power back, let it slow down, okay? Once we get into this red arc, that's where structural things could happen to the aircraft. So you want to avoid that. Almost everything in the aviation world, red, you're dead. You know, that's just kind of seems how things go. You know, red is danger, even at our stoplights. You know, red's an international color for like, oh gosh, things are not good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> things are not good. So, they're pretty, pretty set up that way. Um, so, your airspeed indicator typically in your six pack is usually gonna be in the top left corner. Again, depending on what aircraft you're in, they might move it around a little bit just to have room on that dash. Not every airplane has a lot of room on there, okay? Any questions on the airspeed indicator? Okay, this is, let me highlight something here. The airspeed indicator is the air traveling over the wing. How fast the air is traveling over the wing of the airplane. All right, it's not how fast you are traveling over the ground. Think of it in terms of swimming in the river. You jump out of that boat and now you're trying to swim upstream and you've got the current. You're swimming and swimming and swimming and swimming and you still got that tree sitting right there and you're going nowhere, but you're swimming, right? Now you turn yourself around and you're going the other direction. You're swimming, but now you're just traveling downstream like crazy, okay? The airspeed indicator is the air coming over the wing, not what's coming over the ground. So your airspeed might say 100 miles an hour and you look outside and because we have a headwind, 
you look down and you're like, you know, I'm kind of going nowhere. That was my situation flying from Bozeman, Montana down to Florida. There happened to be a hurricane coming in. <laughs> Most of our weather goes west to east. Well, I had weather going east to west. I was watching tractor trailers pass me up, and I'm just going, really? I'm just burning fuel, just like I was on a treadmill. My ground speed was literally about 35 miles an hour. My airspeed was at 90, but my ground speed, how fast I'm traveling over the ground is like 35, and I'm just going, oh man, you know. It took forever to get to Florida. It took forever, okay? so. Do you kind of understand that analogy, whether you've got a headwind or a tailwind, swimming upstream or swimming downstream? Again, this is just airflow over the wing. That's your airspeed, okay? Once we get that airflow down to here, if you're in the clean configuration, the flaps are up, flaps are in the up position, and you're down at the bottom of this green arc, at that point, the wing is going to not want to provide any more lift. That's when we need to start adding some flaps. That allows us to get slower and still provide lift for that airplane, okay? If you do have the flaps out and you're down to here, that is the minimum airspeed that that, air, that wing is gonna provide lift, okay? When you get down to that point, if you're in the clean configuration, when you're down to here, usually within three to five miles an hour or knots, depending on how they have it set up. Here it's in knots. Within three to five knots of being right there at 50, you're gonna hear a little horn going off in the cockpit. It's called a stall horn. It kind of goes It's like a little gazoo, okay? Some aircraft just have a little red light on the dash. A big, you know, it's just gonna glare at you. What it's telling you is, hey, I want some attention. I don't have enough airspeed for my wings to keep you up in the air. So basically you're just gonna put the nose down and try to get some more airspeed, okay? If you've got flaps fully extended, we can get it right about here. Same thing, about three to five knots above that number, you're gonna start hearing the noise. Hey, I want some attention, you know, that sort of deal, all right? It's warning you. If you ignore it, and you keep getting slower and slower, what comes next? All the pilots know. All of a sudden, well, it's, it's not that, not yet. <laughs> but you start getting a buffeting. You'll start feeling the, the plane actually start kind of bumping around a little bit. It's like going, hey, I want some attention here, you know. It's like a little three-year-old, you know. And if you still ignore it, and you still persist, at that point, now you're going to Valley Fair and you get the roller coaster. Now that nose says, okay, I want some airspeed, and the nose just drops. And it's going to drop until it can build up some airspeed. The aircraft wants to fly. It will fly. Whether, and we're just pilots. We're just there to goof it up. Okay. So that's what's going to happen when you get that airspeed down in that really low range. Okay. Your nose is going to be really high. Okay, compared to the, the horizon of the earth. You're gonna hear that horn going off, giving you, hey, I want some attention, or that little red light. And then after that, the planes are gonna start having a little bit of a shake, a little bit of a buffet. And then after that, if you still continue, again, that nose is just gonna say, okay, fine. You ignored me long enough, now I'm gonna fly the plane myself. And its, it's nose is gonna drop, okay? Hopefully you never get into that situation, okay? So that's one thing to kind of kind of pay attention of, especially on the landing part of it, because we want to slow that airplane up, but we want to slow it up not to that point where you're stalling it and you just <laughs> drop it on the ground. If you had to, again, the whole goal here is for you to just walk away from the plane. I don't care if you bend it, you know, I want you to walk away, all right? The attitude indicator, okay? While we're looking outside, this is a duplication of what's inside. All right, it's a gyro. Basically the whole airplane is moving around this ball that is stabilized, okay? I'm not gonna go into how the gyro affects and all of that, but what we're seeing here is brown, ground, blue sky, all right? So in this situation, this is our aircraft right here. This is you, and this is what's happening outside. So. Can anybody tell me, any of the ladies tell me what's happening in that picture right there? What's the plane actually doing? It's 
banking to the left. No. It's banking to the right. To the right. Yep. So if you looked out the window, that's what you would see outside is the earth, you know, because you're, you're banking off to the right. And he's in a nose low attitude. Here's the horizon, but your nose of the airplane is below. So he's in a basically a descending right hand turn. Okay. So, and this is where I was telling you, you line this up with this, you're going to be wings level. The wings will be level just right with here. Now this is 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30, 60, and 90. So, and that is how much that wing is banked. Okay. Try to avoid excessive banks. So when you turn that yoke to the right, okay, if you just keep going and keep going and keep going, eventually you will take that airplane. We have the ability to just roll it right upside down if we want. Okay. But the goal here is just for you to put it into a nice easy bank. I would really recommend no more than going to that point maximum for anything that you have to do. If you find this little needle right here is sitting over here or over here, you're pretty much in what we call an unusual attitude. Anything over 60 degrees of bank or 30 degrees pitch up or down, okay? So try to hold it at 30 or less maximum, no matter what you're doing. Again, aviate, fly the airplane. There could be other things going on. Somebody could be talking to you in your headset, but fly the airplane first, okay? Your pitch attitude, again, here's your wings level. Here's the nose of the plane. Here's the horizon. This is gonna be five degrees, 10 degrees. Five degrees, 10 degrees, okay? So you can use that as a reference. You're looking outside, you got the horizon, you got the dash of the airplane, you're using that. For myself, when I fly these airplanes, I can put my fingers on the dash, and it's typically between two and three fingers between the horizon and the dash of the airplane, and I'm holding straight level flight. Anything I change, either increasing it or decreasing it, I know the pitch of that plane has changed on me. And I can look over at my altitude indicator and I can see it either climbing or descending, okay? But this will give you the same, same visual. If you get into a cloud, if you're unfortunately and you're flying IFR, instrument conditions, you're stuck in the weather, this is your main source that you are looking at. This will represent what's going on outside. Keep the wings level, okay? And keep the nose of the airplane right here on the horizon. That's your safest bet right there, okay? And then hopefully you're talking to somebody and they can get you out of that weather so you can look back outside the cockpit. This is gonna take 95% of all your attention if you are in the clouds, okay? This is run off of a system called a vacuum system. If for some reason your vacuum system has failed, should you ever be in that condition, which is very unfortunate, you will see this, it's a gyro. So there's a gyro in there that's spinning up, usually at about 20,000 RPM, 16 to 20,000. It makes it rigid. It's used off a vacuum. If the vacuum system fails, that gyro is gonna start what we call spooling down. And all of a sudden you'll notice this start to just work its way into a tumble, okay? A little piece of this you have to kind of train yourself. Does everything else seem normal? Is that the only one that's giving me bad information? And you can tell if that's doing this and you have a turn coordinator over here. Remember that little, I was telling you, there's a thing in here to tell you the quality of your turn using your rudder. This one's also a gyro. If your wings are level here and this looks like that, you can almost guarantee that your attitude indicator is, is failing, your, your vacuum system has failed on you for some unknown reason. Now you're gonna be using this as a reference. When are my wings level, okay? Hopefully that situation never occurs to you. I would still use this as my primary initially and follow that. If you want to come up on a few flights, we will teach you a little bit of how to determine if something like that is wrong, okay? We'll give you a little bit of what we call hood time, where you're flying on instrument, okay? We don't let you look outside, okay? So that's your attitude indicator. It's in the center of the six pack. 
it's your center of attention. Okay. What's the little black button for? This right here? Yeah. What that does, the pilot, when he's on the ground, he gets the airplane started up and the everything's right. Every pilot's a little different in height. Turning this left or right takes this little bar here and just moves it up or down. So in this situation, it's going to move the bar up or down, and he's just making it level with the horizon at that point before he takes off. That's what that's going to do. So hopefully, once you get flying, you'll never have to touch it. It should be set. Okay. Any other questions for the attitude indicator? Okay. Altimeter. All right. This one shows 6,500 feet. He's that's his altitude. All right. This is how you can tell how high you are up in the air. It does not tell you how high you are above the ground. Okay. Here's the analogy I like to use for that. You're down in Florida. You got your feet in the ground. Your feet in the sand and you're out at the beach. Okay. There's a thing called mean sea level and above ground level. MSL, AGL. Okay. If we're sitting in Florida, and I was just there three days ago, I had my feet in the sand, feet in the water. Oh, boy, did that feel good. I'm at zero MSL. Because my feet, it's mean sea level. My feet are touching the water. Okay. So I'm at zero. AGL, above ground level, I'm at zero. Okay. Now, I come driving back up to Minneapolis here. The topography of the United States. You've got mountains, you've got valleys, and everything else. Right now, we are sitting at 906 feet above sea level. So if you look at our tower, you'll see a 906 on it. So above sea level, above Florida's ocean right there, we're 906 feet up. But we are still zero AGL, above ground level. You're just sitting right here on the ground. Does that make sense so far? All of our flying we do is mean sea level. How high above the ocean are we? Okay. So when we go up to pattern altitude, when we're flying here at Minneapolis, it's 1906. It's a thousand foot pattern. Okay. We are 1906 feet above the ocean, but only a thousand feet above flying clouds ground level right here. Okay. So know this number. This is above sea level, not above the ground. Okay? If you're in Florida and you're stuck and you have to do this and you're at, you know, 6,500 feet, you're probably not going to hit any buildings. But now you're flying up towards Colorado. Guess what? There's some mountains out there that are above 6,500 feet. You might have to climb a little bit to avoid hitting the mountain. Okay, so that's the biggest thing about this. Now, there's another big caveat that comes with this. This little, what we call a Colesman window. It's the barometric pressure. We have weather systems that go through the United States 24 seven, okay? You'll hear high pressure systems, low pressure systems, all right? When we get into an airplane, we're always adjusting this to the current pressure setting of where we're at. That is in reference to your MSL, your mean sea level pressure. It's a datum plane, okay? So when you're talking to somebody on the radio, they might say, hey, we want you at 5,000 feet. Uh, set your barometric pressure to 30.02. And you're going to go, what do you mean? Set what to 30.02? You're going to take this little knob, and right there, they're going to have you reset the barometric pressure to what's your local area. That's going to readjust what this reading is going to tell you. Us as pilots, we're always checking the next airport in front of us. We check the weather. You might hear, you know, we're always going, oh, I need the weather over here at this airport. I need to check the ATIS. I need to check this ATIS. And what most of us are doing is, what's the barometric pressure? And the first thing we do is, we're, yeah, 3002. Okay, we reach over and go dial 3002. Just to make sure that we're at the altitude we should be at. If you don't change it, and the pressure gets lower, the pressure gets higher, reality is what that airplane is doing is 
it's holding, if you're trying to hold that altitude that it states right there without changing your barometric, that airplane is either slowly climbing or it's slowly descending because of the barometric pressure, you're keeping that same barometric pressure. Okay? So, if anybody talks to you and says reset your barometric pressure to this, this is where you're going to do it. And it's going to show up right in there. Okay, that'll keep you at the altitude that they want you to be at. Make sense to anybody or is anyone confused on that? Okay, we'll just cover each gauge a little bit. All right, so that's the three up here. We'll go to the next one. Where are we? What direction are we going? Okay, directional gyro, the DG. You know, you're going to hear it called a couple of different things. And we have basically two of them in the aircraft. This is a gyro, this is a gyro, this is a gyro. So they're fixed gyros in the airplane. We have one, only one piece of equipment in that aircraft that is seeking north without any input from anything other than itself. That is our compass, a regular wet compass. Open up a box of Cracker Jacks and you get that, you know, Dick Tracy compass watch in there. That's exactly what that is right there. Okay, so you say you lose your vacuum system again. You lost this and you're going to lose this typically. You still have your compass right there to tell you what direction you're heading. Okay, so if they tell you 6301 Delta, I want you to take a heading of 270 West. All right, if everything's working in the plane, this is labeled north, south, east, west, and it's got every degree on the compass. You're gonna turn that airplane to the left or to the right until, and you even got a little airplane sitting right here, that's you, and you're gonna turn the airplane until it says west right here at the top of it. And now you're heading the direction that they want you to go. Okay, they might give you some odd number. Take a heading of 330. All right. Oh, there's 33. Three. There's no zero, though. Well, it's hard to put all those numbers on the compass. So, 33, three, just add the zero to it. You're heading on a compass heading of 330 degrees, okay, which is basically northwest, right? And in this case, you would turn the airplane to the right. There's 330, okay? Any questions on that? Just your basic directionality, very basic directionality, okay? And what they'll do is they'll keep giving you headings to get you where they want you to be. They might have you go north for a little while, they might have you go west a little while, and then maybe south a little while. Depending on what they're trying to do to help you out, they're just gonna keep giving you headings and you just keep turning it. When you get to that heading, level the wings off. If you see that heading change, just turn a little bit, turn a little bit, you know. They'll usually tell turn right or left though, won't they? In this situation, they will tell you, I want you to turn left to a heading of 220. Left 220. And that helps you out. That way you're not going the long way around. You know, you could have only turned 10 degrees to your left, but instead you went right and turned, you know, 350 degrees. So, got yourself kind of goofed up. Okay. So again, real quick numbers here. North is 360 or zero, depending on what they might tell you. East is 90 degrees, south is 180, west is 270. Now on your, your DG, it'll give you a north, a N, E, you know, a S, and a W. You know, they won't give you the 270, it'll just, good cardinal headings, we call it, cardinal heading. So it's something nice and quick for you to look at, right? Again, if you're asked to turn a specific, gently turn the plane. Don't go into a full 90 degree bank. You know, you just make things a little more difficult on you. 10 degrees, 20 degrees of bank, that's good. Try to, don't go any more than 30, okay? All right. Some of our aircraft have what we call a heading bug. This is a really good tool for any of you that do have this in your airplane, okay? It's just a little button here, and it looks like a little what we call a bug. And in this one, if you see right, oh, I thought I saw it earlier, it's actually sitting right here. 
you can turn this and it's just a little bug that you can put anywhere you want on that compass card. So if they say, hey, turn to a heading of 220, you can take this heading bug and turn it until it sits right on top of 220. And it's a yellow marker. So now you turn the airplane, you get to 220, you got that yellow marker sitting right there. And it's a constant reminder, here's the heading that I want. Here's the heading I should keep, okay? A lot of planes don't have them. If you do have it, it's a wonderful little extra tool just for you to have. So if you see it in your airplane, and you're flying the, you know, more than likely you're going to be flying from the right seat, and you're going to be looking over at these gauges. But if you see that, you can reach over and, and turn it and go, okay, good. All right. Communications. So we went from aviate to navigate. Let's communicate. Let's talk to somebody. Okay. This is a very typical radio. There's basically two types out there. You know, your standard radios that look a lot like this. And then there's the other radio that's going to look a lot like this. This is a Garmin. It's a GPS type. Okay. But we'll start with this one first. All right. Real quickly, all of our radios give you an active frequency that you're currently using right now. And they're going to give you a frequency that we have what in standby. So it's just sitting there waiting to be used. All right. Here it says, use standby. So this is our active frequency. That's our standby frequency. The way that we're going to adjust whatever frequency we need is with these two knobs right here. Okay. This radio is set up in two formats, or it gives you two functions. We have communication right here, and over here we have navigation. All right. In your situation, you probably won't be using much of this unless they ask you to tune to a certain frequency and they'll talk you through something, okay? But you can see right here, communications, navigation. So it's basically two radios in one unit, all right? To change it, you're gonna use the little knob and then the big knob, okay? I kind of think about it, big knob, big numbers, little knob, little numbers. You'll see in this one, it works out really well that way. Big knob, big numbers, little knob, little numbers. It's going to be the same way on this type of radio also. So if you're able to talk to somebody, if this frequency is active and you can hear someone talking on it, great. That is absolutely wonderful. Don't be shy right here. You're going to push that on your yoke. On the co-pilot side, it's typically going to be on the right side of the yoke. That's pretty common. If it's on the pilot side, it's on the left side. Okay. You're going to push that button. Just start yelling, mayday, mayday, mayday. Get somebody's attention. And you're going to get someone's attention really, really fast. Us as pilots, we pay attention to that. Somebody's in distress. Okay. We're going to come back to you. Remember to let go of the button so we can talk to you. Okay, Push the button down to talk. Let go of it so you can listen. I've had a few students, I just push the button down and talk and they just hold it. It's like, okay, the tower wants to get a hold of you now. <laughs> they, you got to let go. <laughs> okay. But first thing, mayday, mayday, mayday. All right. Now most of you probably know what we call the end number on your airplane. Okay. What's the end number on your plane? Memorized, I don't have it. Okay. You mean? It is on the dash. Mm -hmm. Almost always in front of the pilot, it's usually just a little placard. It'll tell you. It'll have an N and it'll have like 6301D, Delta. Okay. That's the call sign on your aircraft. All right. So hopefully you all kind of know where it's at. If you don't, next time you go flying, just take a peek and just kind of know, okay, where is it? Because they're going to ask you, who are you? Well, I'm an airplane. <laughs> you know, okay, that helps. You know, you're not a helicopter. That's good. You know, I'm one, two, three, four, zebra. Okay, good. We got you. That's covered there. All right. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Okay, what can we help you with? All right. Just tell them what's going on. You need help getting on the ground. Talk to them. It's like talking to mom and dad up in a tower. It's like talking to whoever. Don't be shy. It's not a time to be shy. Okay. They might tell you to put a certain frequency in. If you can't reach anybody, 
Okay, if you're somewhere and the, you don't hear anything and you're yelling mayday, 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 and nobody's coming back to you, no one's coming back to you, here's my recommendation. 121.5, it's an emergency frequency. 121.5. If you have notes or whatever, you wanna write it down, go for it. Put that into the standby right here, 121.5. There's a flip-flop switch. Okay, okay, how do I get from standby to active or to use it? This little arrow right here, you just push it and then this frequency is gonna come over here. This current frequency is gonna jump over there. They're just gonna flip-flop, okay? Now you got 121.5 here. Mayday, 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 one, two, three, four, zebra. Mayday, 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 one, two, three, four, zebra. You know, someone's gonna come back to you. Center monitors that frequency. Air traffic control, they monitor the frequency. Airline pilots, they always monitor that frequency when they're en route. A lot of private pilots and a lot of professional pilots if they have two radios, they will monitor 121.5 while they are en route, just in case anything like this happens, we're there to help you, okay? So 121.5, put it in there, okay? Your other radio, very common, getting more and more common every day in the world of aviation, is a Garmin 430 or some type of GPS type of radio, okay? It's set up the same way. We still have our communications. We still have our navigation, okay? You've got your active frequency, your standby frequency, okay? So anything that's white is active. Anything that's blue is standby, all right? You might be wondering why is this highlighted, okay? We have to be able to go from here to here to change frequencies if needed. Okay, in the previous slide, we have a knob right here to change these frequencies. If we want to change these, we use this knob. We don't have that option in this type of radio. What we do have is right here where it says push, communication or VOR. Okay, if you push this knob in, this highlighted box is now gonna jump down here. Now we can use the big knob, little knob to change any frequency we want right here. Okay. If this is highlighted and we need to go up here, we just push it again, boom, it's gonna pop up here and highlight this box like this. Now we can use big knob, little knob to change the frequency. In order to go from standby to active, there's that little flip-flop switch, the little two arrows. Just push that and then this frequency is gonna come up here to active. Again, you can put in 121.5, mayday, mayday, mayday. Okay, but if somebody is talking on that frequency, talk to them. Let them know what's going on. They might advise you to go to a different frequency other than 121.5. They might say, hey, we want you to talk to air traffic control. The frequency is 134.2. All right, turn this 134.2, switch it over. Hello, mayday, mayday, mayday. Who's there? Ah, we got you. Now they'll, they'll help you out, okay? That's the biggest thing there, all right? If you have one of these, this is great for situational awareness because you've already got a little bit of a map here. It's a GPS unit, okay? They can talk you through how to get to a certain destination. On a GPS, the Garmin 430s, in the pilot world, you hear a lot of direct, enter, enter. Okay, which is this little button right here, direct. Direct to, you can push that. You can use these little buttons here. It's gonna come up with another screen and you can put in a specific identifier for an airport like Flying Cloud, KFCM. And you hit enter, you'll get a little thing that says activate. Enter again. Now what it does is it draws a little magenta line from here right to your airport. There's your, there's your course. Whoever you're talking to can talk you right through that. And now you go, okay, now I know I need to go this direction to f stay on top of that magenta line and get me towards my course, okay? A little bit more than what I would like to go into at this point, but it's some basic things for that, all right? The biggest key for you is right here and 121.5.
one other thing to hit on the previous radio, which is, looks like ours, we have COM1 and COM2. There's also a switch off to the right. So that it's like that bank times two. Yes. And you have to make sure that you're actually talking to the upper bank or the lower bank. Correct. Come to. Yep. Uh, when I started, uh, that was very confusing. Like, wh what of all the numbers am I talking to? Mm -hmm. so if they left side, you know, and upper or lower. Sure. Yeah, you will have in a lot of airplanes have the exact same radio, but duplicate. You'll have another one sitting right down below it. In almost every situation, whichever radio is on top is going to be considered COM1. Everything down here is going to be considered COM2. And then you might have an audio panel up here, just like on your old, back when we were in high school and we had that cool little stereo system. You know, you could go from tuner to phonograph to 8-track or whatever. You know, you're going to have an audio panel up here. And it's going to say COM1, COM2, COM3, NAB1, NAB2, whatever. Whichever one you're talking on, select it up here. COM1, make sure COM1 is selected. And when you talk, you're talking on this one. If you need to talk on COM2, push COM2, and now you'll be talking on this radio down here. So we all remember those stereo systems we had from Radio Shack and Pioneer and all the other good stuff. Should be set to the one, though, before I died. So right. it's likely. Right. And more than likely, more than likely, nothing's going to have changed. And then unless the, the standby frequency, man, unless it's ATIS or something, is probably another, you know, like if you're flying around here, you've probably got the tower on and then you yep. have the common track yep. by frequency for wherever the local is. Yeah. Now, worst case scenario, I hate to use you as the worst case scenario, you're checking ATIS right. and all of a sudden, uh, yep. you're now incapacitated. Right. She's going, okay, hello, hello, hello. You're, you're talking to a machine. Nothing's there. Now she needs to figure out how to either, one, hit the flip-flop switch. Does anybody answer? Still nobody answers. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to 121.5. Get that active. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Someone's going to pick up and find you. Okay. Actually, I actually always write 1.15 on my knee pad so I don't have to think about it. There we go. I've seen some planes that I've flown with, some friends, and they've actually placarded the radio, just emergency 121.5, in case no matter who's in his airplane, he knows right there. It's right in front, big, bold red letters. So those of you that are private pilots for your spouses or whatever, that might be something you want to do and say, here, worst case scenario, it's right there. So don't be afraid to teach them while you're flying. Here, take the plane. You show me how I change radio stations. It's a huge key. I've taught my wife so much since that day she never wanted to touch the yoke. You know, she's like, why do I want to fly the plane? I said, what if I like cacked right now? And she goes, oh, well, that's a good thought, you know? So little things like that, you can really help your own situation out tremendously. Okay, just little things. Show her where the checklist is. Okay, boom, here's the checklist. Follow it. You know, make them do the pre flight for you. Make them do some of the checklist. Make them read it off to you and you perform it. That helps tremendously. It's what we're going to do when you come fly with us. I'm going to give you the checklist. Say, okay, I'm going to walk you through it. Here's where everything is. That sort of thing. Okay? But yeah, that is a really good point if you have two radios. A lot of planes just have one radio. So you're doing multitasking on that single radio. And you might not have the frequency that you want. You'll find a lot of times, a lot of pilots, if they have two radios, okay? Radio number one is for communications to talking to center, tower, ground, whoever. Radio number two on the comm is what they're going to use for weather. That's very common in, in the industry here. They'll use that second radio just to pick up weather and ATIS and everything else. But they're going to be using that audio panel up here. They'll have COM1 selected so they can listen to this and talk if they need to. And then they'll reach over and they'll select COM2 so they're both highlighted. So now he's listening to this plus he's listening to this. Not everybody is talking on COM1 all the time. Sometimes it's quiet. Now you can listen to the ATIS and get the weather and stuff like that. For you, in this situation, Weather's not going to be a huge concern for you. The whole goal here is to talk to somebody and get this plane back on the ground in one piece. Get yourself on the ground in one piece. Okay? 
have another question. You have the transponder frequency here, the numbers too. Do, would you? That's coming up. Okay, I was going to say, would you? Us, um, you think that's seventy-seven hundred? Bang. Do they find you in that? Well, I'll wait to hear. Thing, but I was wondering, do they find you in that case? If you just say they, I, they will know where you are. I'm talking to anybody. I just want to get yep. that number in, and somebody find me. If you're flying locally here in in, in Minnesota. Minneapolis, you put 7,700 in your transponder, yeah. you're gonna get someone's attention right now. Will they, will they know what frequency you're on? Though? Nope, they can't, but. They can't actually find you. But, well they do, I mean, they, they can find you. Physically, you. but they can't talk to you. Correct, not yet. Okay. Not yet, but they know on their radar screen, yeah, all of a sudden, boom, you show up 7,700 and they're going, okay, I got an aircraft in distress. Who else is out in that area? They might do a visual. Uh, they might be talking to some guy in a bonanza saying, hey, because he's talking to him saying, okay, I got an aircraft here three miles off your left wing at 2,500 feet. I got a distress. Can you check them out? Can you help us out? Okay. Almost every single time that pilot's going to go, I'm on it. Boom. They're going to get over and they're going to get right up on your wing and they're going to do a visual. Say, okay, what's going on? And you might see some person in there who's incapacitated. If it's a single pilot, uh, if it's a passenger in there and they're trying to fly the plane they're going to see that airplane and they're going to you, you'll the eyeballs will be this big yeah. you know and they might be able to <laughs> <With two hands. laughs> well it's well that's the situation you know you think about it mm -hmm. really think about that stressful situation what's going on and they might have to hold up a sign saying one two one point five you know and just to, that's what this course is for i wish more people would come just to have an understanding of that situation i think the radio is harder than flying the plane yes, i mean that all makes I sense yeah. you can look at it the chances they actually yeah. get great frequency is <laughs> need some yeah. Thought. Yeah. Yeah, yeah especially if you're stressed but when i took my ground school i mean they had that number in your brain you'd never forget it if you did yep. any training that's yep. interesting I don't There's actually some nice, there, <laughs> you know, apps for the radio you can play with even on a PC. Yeah. Just to familiarize yourself. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So, but yeah, that's kind of how this is working. So, kind of going forward a little bit, uh, communicate, let's talk. Some, here's the yoke, your typical yoke. You'll find on the pilot side, it's usually on the left side of the handle. On the co-pilot side, it's usually going to be sitting on this side. It's not always up here on the top of the horn or whatever. Sometimes they'll put it right down here, but there's usually a little button somewhere. I actually had one airplane I was in, there was a button on the dash for the passenger. It's over here, buried off to the right somewhere. And I was like, where the heck is it? You know, oh, there it is. You know, so it's wherever they put them in the airplane. Most typically, typically, it's going to be on the yoke switch because they want your hands on the yoke and then you can just hit the button while you're still flying the plane. Aviate. Okay? Remember, release to listen. <laughs> okay? Transponder. It's another piece of equipment. It usually sits just below the radios. It's another little thin piece of equipment. Um, we've got some stuff in here that you put in either one of these three frequencies and they're set up as to what's wrong with that aircraft at that time. 7700 is an emergency okay typically when you're flying your transponder is going to have a 1200 in there your vfr transponder unless you're an ifr pilot you you ifr okay you might have a weird code in there it might say 4326 or something okay all you got to do is put in 7700 and they're going to know you need attention right now more than likely, the radio's already set, he's talking to center. And they're gonna come back to you, what's wrong? What can I help you with? And I'm also dealing with, you know, retractable landing gear and other things. Okay. High performance plane. What, what do you have? Uh, Mooney 20 Dre. Okay, nice little plane. So, even if you leave the gear up, who cares? You know, the goal is to get you on the ground and walk away from that airplane. Insurance will fix the airplane. All right. It's a club plane, so. <laughs> there you go. Everybody will the, be very mad. <laughs> no, everyone will be very happy because you walked away from that airplane. Who cares about the plane? What we care about is you, okay? That's the whole thing. Everyone else will be ecstatic. We'll figure that piece out later, all right? But the transponder, if you have the emergency 7700, 
if for some reason you lost your radios, you can't talk to anybody. No matter what you do, you can't pick up anyone on the radio. Put 7600 in there. They know you can't talk to anyone. Okay? You, sometimes you might be able to hear them, but you can't talk to them. They'll, kill, they'll still keep trying to talk to you, just in case you can hear them. Okay? I know you have enough on your plate. You're trying to fly the plane. You're trying to get it on the ground. You're worried about the person next to you because now they're incapacitated for whatever reason. You're trying to figure out where am I going to land this thing. Okay? If you have enough sense about you, you're able to relax a little bit, and that's my first thing. <sighs> Just take a deep breath. Okay? Try to get the anxiety down a little bit. It's already a stressful situation. Maybe you have time to do a little bit of troubleshooting. If you're in autopilot, you're in cruise flight, grab their headset. Can you talk to anybody? You see where their headsets are plugged in. You know, maybe you could try something different. If you're able to do that. If not, rule number one is what? Fly the plane. Don't worry about everything else. Fly the plane. But again, if you lost calm, they will keep trying to talk to you. Okay. The last one, hopefully nobody ever has to do that in our little airplanes. I, th I thought I might have to. <laughs> one time I thought I might have to do it. I had one discovery flight that made me really nervous. So, but uh, that's okay. That would have been a karate chop to the throat. No. <laughs> My airplane, not yours. Okay, so I'll show you what the transponder looks like. This is a very typical looking transponder. Very standard looking, okay? And this is where we have our 1200. You're going to put 1200, zero, zero. okay? That's a VFR. Or 7700. Zero, zero. I have an emergency, okay? If you're talking to center, you're talking to a tower, you're talking to another pilot, okay? They could be relaying a message to you. Sometimes they'll say, We want you to ident, yeah. okay? There's a little button right here that says ID. They just want you to push that. What happens is, Minneapolis Center, all these guys that are sitting down in the basement looking at radar, all of a sudden, and they have you on radar, they can see your little information, all of a sudden it goes boom, gets really bright. They can identify you between four or five other airplanes that are in the area. And believe me, you'll probably have a couple other airplanes right next to you trying to help you out. So it just boom, it balloons. So now they can identify you. Okay, we know who you are, okay? You have a couple of switches here. You, you might hear the term squawk. You're going to hear that a lot. We want you to squawk altitude. Well, don't put in, okay, I'm at 2,500 feet. <laughs> you know, um, Squawk altitude means we want you to turn this knob up to altitude. Now what that does, it tells this box, it's going to send information off to whoever interrogates you what your altitude is because it's tied into your pedostatic system, your altitude system. They're gonna, it's going to show up, oh, they're at 3,700 feet, that sort of thing. That's what they mean by squawk altitude, okay? You've already put, hopefully, 7,700 in here. Hopefully, it's already on altitude. That's pretty normal. Just before you take off, the pilot's going to go through his checklist and go, click. He's either going to go from standby to altitude, pretty much, okay? Any questions there? Just in terms of, uh, you said, like, uh, um you know, fly the plane, navigate, communicate. But in this situation, would you flip it and say, fly the airplane, stick 7700 in there, then do a bunch of other stuff? Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as like a kind of a checklist of emergency, that's the easiest thing to do. Yep. Everybody in the air knows that you're in trouble. Yep. Aviate. And well, well, I wouldn't even navigate well, at that point. I don't really care where sure. you're going. I just like fly a plane straight and level, tell everybody I'm in distress. Yep. Uh, well, or what do you th think? It, it's just a general term that we use. Again, it depends on that situation. And if you are in, you know, in, in a cruise flight, you're already you're already navigating. Yeah. Okay, you're already in a heading. Hold that heading. Right. right. Just stay there. Now come over. Okay, I need 7700 in the transponder. 7700. Zero, zero. Good. That's set. Radio. Okay. Can I talk to anyone? Hello. Hello. Mayday. 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 No one's there. Okay, 121.5. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Oh, now I can talk to somebody. So it's, you are navigating at the same time. So hold that heading, whatever you got going on. Don't suddenly just start flying in random circles. Okay. okay. So it kind of works, but again, it depends on that situation and so like if you're trying where you're at. If, if you 
try to talk to someone, I mean, the quickest reassurance is to hear someone else. It, it is. 2,000 feet over the middle of godforsaken nowhere, which is most of this state. Yeah. You know, you could squawk whatever you want, and you may be below radar. I mean, the other planes aren't going to know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not going to know you're squawking anything. So sure. I'd still try to talk mm -hmm. to someone. Yep. It's wh whatever kind of works, but we're kind of get you through the methodology, aviate, navigate, communicate, okay, that sort of deal. So first of all, just fly the plane. If you're on a certain heading, stay on that heading for now. Now start working with the radios and your transponder and see who can I get a hold of, who can help me out. There's people there to help you, and they will, okay? But real quick on the transponder, there's how you're gonna set your frequencies. Try to make sure you're up there. If you see this little light blinking on and off, that means you're being interrogated by some radar system. And that information, the transponder is actually gonna send information back to that radar system, telling them what's going on. If this light's never blinking, like you said, you might be outside of radar contact for like Minneapolis or wherever you might be. You might be in the middle of nowhere, okay? Um, that's just a good indicator of what's happening. So obviously if it's blinking, it's saying, hey, I'm replying to whoever just in interrogated me. I'm gonna reply to it, okay? So this is your basic one right here. This is one of the more advanced ones, back to Garmin units. And it's just basically a digital unit versus an analog unit. We've got ident, same thing. Center says, hey, we want you to ident. Just push that button. You're gonna balloon on their radar screen. Um, if you're an IFR pilot and you're switching to VFR, you're on an instrument flight plan, now you're going back to visual flight rules. You know, instead of punching in 1200, you, can, you have the option here, which is nice, just hit VFR, and it's gonna put 1200 right in there. For you girls, in this situation, you're gonna hit 77, Zero zero, because you want someone to get attention. You want somebody's attention. Okay, and then you can pretty much leave that as is. You're probably already going to be in altitude, so it's going to be given that information too. If not, hit altitude. Now it's going to give that altitude information to whoever interrogates you. Okay, so that's just the difference between kind of like your your older analog ones and your newer ones right now. Okay. So that's pretty much what we have for the flight, the ground portion of it. If you want to take a few flights, here's kind of like how we kind of work it out for you. Uh, your first flight, we're going to give you a good ground lesson. You've already been around some aircraft, but we're going to let you do the checklist. We'll do have you do the walk around so you're comfortable with the airplane, outside and inside the airplane. And then we're going to kind of get you up in the air and just let you have the controls and just feel what it's like to fly the plane by yourself. Obviously, we're with you, but you're going to be handling all the controls, okay? The second flight is just your controls. We're going to have you learn how to do some climbs, some descents, and some turns. Very basic maneuvers, and how to handle the radios, okay? How do I get from one frequency to the next if needed? What do I have to do for the transponder if needed? The third flight is just getting you into how can I land this airplane and get it on the ground safely, okay? So that's how we kind of set it up here. So tell your friends, take your spouses, show them the cockpit, show them the checklists, work your way through it, you know, teach them everything you can while you are flying with them. And hopefully someday this situation will never happen. That's the goal. Okay. So thank you.